Good morning, and welcome to South Church, Granby. I'm Reverend Dr. Sandra Fisher, and I, along with my colleague, Reverend Denny Moon, and the deacons and leaders of South Church, welcome you to worship this morning. We have a few announcements in our common life together. Uh, today, there is coffee hour, of course, after the service. Please follow the link in your e-blast. Faith Journey is meeting at 4.30 and the youth group at 6.30. On Monday, there's Bible study uh, with First Church at 3 o'clock. Scripture is John 15, verses 9 through 17. That's at 3 p.m. on Zoom. Tuesday, the food uh, share truck is coming from 1.30 to 2 p.m. And there's uh, storytelling at 6.30 p.m., uh, also via Zoom. Those of you involved in storytelling should have received the link by email. Wednesday is the Waste Not Want Not uh, community meal drive through from 3 to 5 with handbell rehearsals at uh, 5.45 in the sanctuary, socially distanced and masked. Thursday, there's a Granby Racial Reconciliation Meeting. And Sunday, we have a worship service hosted by First Church at 10 a.m. on Mother's Day. And please celebrate your uh, mother by sending a photo along with her name and yours to sue at firstchurchgranby, all one word, dot O-R-G. Uh, so the uh, special Mother's Day service is a joint uh, service. It is hosted by First Church, and it'll be live streamed at 10 a.m. on Facebook. And also we have a UCC Granby uh, blood drive co-sponsored by First Church and South Church on Wednesday, May 12th. It will be held at Cook Hall at First Church uh, from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m., and if you would like to uh, schedule an appointment to donate blood, you can call the Red Cross at 800-733-2767 or go online at www.redcrossblood.org. And with that, let's place our hands on our heart and take three deep breaths. Let us prepare to worship God.
Good morning. Kids, do you know what it feels like to know something or someone really well? It isn't just an understanding of what that person or that thing is. It's a knowing deep down inside of you. Let me give you some examples. After a long day, you walk into your kitchen and you smell your favorite meal being cooked by one of the adults in your life. The smell is so good and it makes you feel not only hungry, but also so loved. It is more than just a meal. It is the familiarity of having that good smell around you, being made by someone who loves you, and the anticipation of something you know will taste good. What about knowing a person? Of course, you know lots of people. All the people in your family and in your class, the people that work at your school, and the people that attend it, the people on your sports teams. But what about really knowing a friend and that friend really knowing you? That is different from just knowing someone in your class. That is a feeling of being completely comfortable, knowing that no matter what you say or do, you will be loved. There is an ease of being with that person. Really knowing someone means that you know what makes that person happy and sad. You know how to be a good friend to that person when they are not having a great day, and that person can do the same for you. Did you know that Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Here, Jesus is giving us an example that he is like a good shepherd. He knows his sheep. Well, what does that mean for a shepherd to know their sheep, to really know them? It means that the shepherd knows when they are hungry or thirsty, knows when a baby sheep has lost their way from his mama, knows that the sheep might like a little scratch on the head or a little scratch on the back. And the sheep know what the shepherd wants of them. They know it so well that the shepherd's voice is the only one the sheep will respond to. Look on YouTube and see if you can find a video of a shepherd calling their sheep. It's amazing that they only respond to the shepherd's voice and not the voice of other people. They know deep down that they will be cared for and loved by that shepherd. When we think about knowing God and God knowing us, think about that deep down knowing that feeling you get of familiarity when you smell your favorite meal or are with your best friend. And remember that image of the good shepherd and the sheep. God's presence of love is all around us, beckoning us to know and be known. Good morning, my name is Linda Sweeto and I am the Deacon of the Day today at South Church. Our reading today from the Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 9 through 16. Here Jesus uses the image of the Good Shepherd to portray the kind of care he gives his sheep. As we hear the words of Scripture, let us listen in the words for the Word of God. Jesus said, I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The sheep hear my voice. I call my sheep by name and lead them out. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd, does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. As the father knows me and I know the father. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of God shall stand forever.
Now is the time we come together to share our joys and concerns. Please write them in the chat box. Uh, this is a prayer today inspired in part by John Vandelar. Pray with me. Good Shepherd, teach us to hear your voice and to follow you, to care for all that are close to us, to protect those who are threatened, to welcome those who are rejected, to forgive those who are burdened by guilt, to heal those who are broken and sick, to share with those who have little or nothing, to take the time to really know each other and love as you have loved us. Good Shepherd, teach us to hear your voice and to follow you, to spread compassion to those who are far away, to speak for those who are voiceless, to defend those who are oppressed and abused, to work for justice for those who are exploited, to make peace for those who suffer violence, to take the time to recognize our connectedness and to love as you have loved us. Good Shepherd, teach us to hear your voice and to follow you and to be faithful to calling you gave us to be shepherds in your name. And now let us join together in the words that Jesus, our Good Shepherd, taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning and thank you for being here with us today at South Church to worship God together. Uh, a story I may have told some of you before. In 1977, I had just gotten my Master's of Divinity degree. I had, been, I had done my field work in a church outside of Boston. I was 27 years old, married with a child on the way, and I had given four years of my life over to this process of becoming a minister. And I was about to get my first ministerial job. 
All that was left was that my ordination paper had to pass muster. And in my red beard and long hair, I was dressed in a turtleneck sweater and jeans. And I sat before uh, six middle-aged to retired ministers who were dressed in polyester suits and wide ties. It was the 70s, after all. And they drilled me with questions. Did I think the Bible was the only perfect rule for faith, doctrine, and conduct? Well, I said I'm uncertain about the word perfect. Well, why? Well, because I don't believe the husband is the head of the wife. Some of them scribbled notes on paper. Another asked, who is God? And I said, I believe God is the power of creativity and continues in the process of creation even today. Hmm, that sounds like you believe in evolution, one said. Oh, I said, evolution isn't something you believe in or not. It just is. More scribbling. It went on like that for 45 minutes. And then I stepped out for five minutes and... When they called me back in, they thanked me for my hard work, but said they could not ordain me at this time. I would receive a critique in the mail with changes to be made, and I could come back next year and try again. Now, this was happening during a, a large conference of ministers, so that when I walked out of the room, all the meetings had just let out for lunch, and the hall was filled with ministers hurrying down the hallway, all of them talking to one another. And, but I just stood there, sinking fast. What was I going to do? What if the church that had hired me rejected me now that I didn't have the stamp of approval from the denomination? How would I make money to support our growing family? Has all of this been a waste? Would I have to find new work altogether? And with ministers hustling by me on either side, I, I felt alone in the crowd, tears filling my eyes. And then from a distance, I heard, Denny! Hey! Denny! Even though the voice was faint above the din, I knew whose it was. Alden, the minister of my fieldwork church. It meant so much to hear his voice, someone who knew me, who loved me, who shared many of the same beliefs that I did. And just with the sound of his voice, I no longer felt alone. And I swung around and I spotted him at the top of a landing. Hey, let's have lunch, he shouted. I wanna hear how it went and he headed down the stairs. Jesus says in the Gospel of John, I am the good shepherd. My sheep know my voice and I call them by name. And John is trying to give Jesus' followers that, that sense of belonging that I felt when I heard Alden's voice calling my name. You are not alone, for there is someone who knows you, who doesn't simply know about you, but knows you. And regardless of what others might say, you belong. The sheep know the shepherd's voice, and their shepherd knows the sheep's name as well. That's amazing to me. I mean, sheep look pretty much the same, don't they? I mean, I could tell a little one from a big one, but, but a flock of them? <laughs> no way. I couldn't tell one from another, much less call them by name. But the Good Shepherd knows each individual one. The Gospel of John is pointing to the nature of Jesus' relationship with his disciples and God's relationship with us as personal and close. This doesn't mean God is a person, male, female, or otherwise, but that the nature of being itself is relational. In other words, we discover ourselves, our life. We, we come alive, not in isolation, but in relationship to others. 
And that is where we experience God, in the midst of our bonds with others and our connection to creation. The nature of this relationship is, is in opposition, the Gospel of John says, to the thief who sneaks in and destroys or steals. The thief has yet to discover that, that mutuality is the nature of things. For the thief, life is a matter of every person for themselves. The thief sacrifices the sheep for the benefit of the thief. I mean, in the thief's eyes, reality is a matter of taking. Nothing is going to be given, so grab for yourself what you can while you can. And there are plenty of takers in the world. Most of us have a part of ourselves, me included, that is a taker. It comes out when I get tired and I, I think that the world owes me something and I'm entitled to what I want when I want it. Jesus, however, is not a thief, but a good shepherd. John also juxtaposes the good shepherd against the, the hired hand. The hired hand thinks that reality is transactional. You pay me, and I'll do a job for you. I do a favor for you, and you owe me a favor. And friends become commodities. Nothing is freely given. All moves are strategic to get something out of someone else. So, I will protect your sheep, yes, as a hired hand. I might even learn their names. But if a wolf comes along and doesn't run away when I throw my rod and my staff at it, pff, I'm out of here. John is referring to particular characters in the previous chapter. See, in the chapter before this is the story of Jesus and his disciples seeing a blind beggar. The disciples ask Jesus, who sinned that caused this man to be blind, him or his parents? This is a transactional view of life. If somebody hadn't done something wrong, he would still have his sight. The assumption behind that is, is that if, if you do things right, all will go well for you. Well, Jesus refuses to accept this transactional assumption, and he spits on the ground, and he makes a mud paste out of his saliva, and then he smears it on the man's eyes. And then he tells the man to go wash his eyes out in the, peel, in the pool that's down the road a bit. And so the man leaves Jesus, he goes to the pool and he washes, and he can see. But people don't know what to make of the blind man who's been begging on the corner for years, who now can see. They can't even believe it's the same fellow. And the religious leaders say that whoever did this was not of God because he did it on the Sabbath when you are not supposed to be working. So they start asking the man questions, and he gives them the play-by-play, -play, telling them about a guy named Jesus wiping goo on his eyes and telling him to wash it off, and, and when he did, voila, he could see. But that doesn't satisfy him, and they ask more and more questions, and they even drag his family into the whole thing, but the family doesn't know anything. And with every investigation, the man who was once blind seems to see more clearly what's going on. And at the climax of the story, the religious leaders are grilling him, asking him who he thinks Jesus is. And he says, I don't know who the fellow is. All I know is I used to be blind and now I can see. And the religious leaders reply, you were born entirely in sin. And you are trying to teach us? How dare you? And they drove him out. And upon hearing this, Jesus seeks the fellow out. And for the first time, the man puts Jesus' voice together with a face. He sees him. And Jesus asks him, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Some might call the human one. We, we, we might say the one who truly defines what it means to be human. And the man says, I don't know who he is. And Jesus says, the one who you see and hear now. John has a pattern in his gospel. 
of Jesus performing a sign such as the healing of the blind man and then afterward delivering a teaching about that sign. The religious leaders you see are the hired hands, the ones who think that the nature of life is transactional. I come, Jesus declares, that they may have life abundant. But abundance doesn't mean that you're healed, everything's taken care of that's wrong in your life and that it's perfect. No, no, abundance is found when you discover that the nature of your life is in relationship. Abundance is found when you discover that you don't have to be a thief, that life is not a matter of taking, but life is a matter of gift. Abundance is found when, when you discover that life isn't transactional. It's not a matter of turning everything into a commodity, a deal. Abundance is discovering that you belong in God's creation and to God's creation, that you belong in God's community and to God's community. What this means is that the nature of life is sacrificial. I lay down my life for the sheep, Jesus says. This could mean literally losing your life as Jesus did, or it might mean giving your life for others, living a life of service and compassion. As Jesus says elsewhere, you must lose your life to save it. But the abundance won't be found unless you're willing to risk sacrifice. There are other sheep that do not belong to this fold, Jesus says. But the belonging of which Jesus speaks is larger than the definition of any given fold. Jesus says, or John says as much in that verse, God so loved the world. The nature of life is relational. Abundance is found in love. And Jesus is confident about the sheep of other folds. He says, they will listen to my voice and there will be one flock. Alden and I sat down for lunch and he listened while I told the story. The husband, not the head of the wife. Evolution, not a matter of belief. Ministers scribbling notes for 45 minutes. He just listened and occasionally nodded his head. And, and when I was done, he heaved a, heaved a sigh and he said, I'm sorry you had to go through that. But some people are paint by numbers kind of folks and people like you who think outside of their box, that scares them. But there are a lot of us who are outside the lines with you. And my guess is that your next ordination committee will have a few of those folks on it. And don't worry, the church who hired you doesn't give a rip about what your ordination committee thinks. They want you because you think outside the lines. And so it was. <laughs> it's crazy. I, I waited for six years to submit another ordination paper. And two of the ministers on the committee said it was the best one they had ever read. And I was accepted. Eventually, as you know, I didn't fit. And I left that denomination of my own accord to be part of a flock that accepted sheep from any and every fold, the United Church of Christ. And Alden, well, he left that denomination too, and he became the administrator of a retirement home. We're still friends. There's a place for all of us. The nature of life is not taking, nor is it transactional. It is relational. And the abundance of life is found in our relationship with one another, regardless of what fold we come from. It is there, in those relationships, that we glimpse the love of God, which is the abundance that Jesus brought. Amen. Welcome to this meal celebrated by Jesus and his disciples. 
uh, there in that Holy Week on Monday, Thursday. You know the story. You know that uh, Jesus had been betrayed by one of his followers and that uh, all of his disciples uh, fled when he was taken to the cross to be executed. Um, his mother and other women stayed with him around the cross. And he had shared this uh, meal, letting his disciples know that they would be, uh, that he would be leaving them and that they would be uh, together uh, beginning this new movement of which we still are a part. It celebrates the kind of relationship he was talking about, uh, the close relationship between shepherd and sheep, between Jesus and his followers, and between his followers as well. To signify this, he took bread and he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. Eat it in remembering me. And after supper, he took a cup of wine and said, this is my blood shed for you. As often as you gather together, drink this in remembering me, the one who was willing to lay down his life for the sheep. Let us drink. Shall we pray? We give thanks, O oh God, for our entire lives, for your creation in which we live and move, which encompasses us with, with beauty and with uh, life-giving sources. We thank you for our families, relationships to whom we feel close, for our friendships, for being woven together as part of your people in our community of faith. We pray for your presence in our midst, that we might glimpse God in the love that we share with each other and with those from other flocks, that we might be compassionate in our service to you and to the world and to each other. In your name we pray. Amen. Go forth into the world and serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God. Rejoicing through the power of the Holy Spirit, the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.